Hello, can you guys hear me now? I know some people chimed in before. I hope you hung in there with us. Can anybody hear me? Hello! In space, no one can hear me scream. Hello, hello! Hi, whoever just came in, can you tell me if you can hear me? Can you hear me? Yes! Yes! Thank you! Ooh, yeah! Woo! Ah, we had to start over. I don't know what caused that. It wasn't, it was just some problem. Anyway, sound, sound, sound. Thank you all for being here so much. Um, lots of people already showing up. Um, ah, so good to see you all. Um, hello from Pennsylvania. Let's see, now, Pennsylvania is where I thought I would be today because we are moving, but then we had moving slowdowns, which made me think about the topic of getting stuck in various places. So now we are going to talk about the issue of getting stuck. So sorry I didn't get to like welcome everybody and like look at all the place names. I can see a lot of people, you know, popping in from Tucson, from Ontario, from Madison, Georgia, from Belfast, Maine, from everywhere. Um, from Oz, Illinois. I love that. So I was thinking about getting stuck. When I was doing active life coaching, the biggest draw for people coming into me was they felt stuck. I often think how weird it is that humans have this sense of being stuck because no other animal has that. It's not like today, Karen, um, my one of my family members, did see a mountain lion in our pasture. Huh, yeah, she came running home and she got her cardio exercise for the week because she was terrified. Anyway, um, I was thinking a mountain lion never gets stuck. The deer outside in, in the woods aren't going, oh, I just feel like I'm becalmed. I can't make any progress forward in my life. You just don't see it because only humans do things that are so 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 far advanced from basic biological function that we actually can get stuck in them and not go forward and not have a biological reminder get, to get going again. Other animals, when they're tired, they sleep. When they're hungry, they eat. And they don't really get stuck in the middle of it, but we do. So first I want to give us humans a big shout out for doing things that allow us to get stuck. Now, the problem is that when you get that far away from nature and you get culture, culture asks us to do all kinds of things that are very far from our nature. And some of those things are, well, virtually all of them are incredibly hard. I mean, the whole process of buying and selling property is incredibly hard. All this paperwork, all these people moving parts in it. Like, animals never have to do that. They just go from place to place. The, what I'm trying to do in the middle of moving, writing a, a book, that is easy to get stuck in the middle of. Um, it's easy to dangle your participles too. I just did that. But any big thing that you try to do, including just building a life arc for yourself, a, a life story that you're gonna be happy and proud to look back on, just dangled another participle, um, that's an easy place to get stuck. And much of my life has been spent being stuck. And much of the rest of my life has been spent helping other people get unstuck. So whatever you're stuck in, whether you know you just can't get the oomph to like paint the house, or you can't get up the, the nerve to go out and make relationships happen, or you feel like you have gifts that you're not developing, wherever you're stuck, go there and think about that and have questions ready for me when I'm done with my little spiel here. So the first thing to do when you feel stuck is stop trying to be unstuck because trying to get unstuck is like a Chinese finger puzzle. You know, you try to pull away and it actually tightens the trap. So all this struggling and the, the effort actually makes you get stuck. The, the energy of, pushing against something makes reality push back. Remember that reality is a mirror and whatever you do, it will do 
in response. If you clench your fist at the world, the world will clench your fist, its fists at you. When you love everything, everything seems to love you back. It's very, try it, it's, it works. Um, even things that appear unloving at first, if you're really in love with the world, end up looking loving. So when you try and push to get unstuck, everything tries and pushes back and it just locks you in. So the first thing is to stop trying. And how do you stop trying? Here's the deal. You give yourself permission to do what you're actually going to do. Not long-term, but like on a given day. If I get up and, um, for example, I got up the other morning and I was really tired. I, I couldn't fall asleep. And my brain was really jumbled. And I got up early to write, but I only had like three hours of sleep. And I sat there staring at my screen and I tried to make my brain think and it wouldn't. So instead of continuing to try, because I know how to get myself unstuck, I said, this is not gonna happen. Realistically, if I am honest, if I'm in full integrity, what I'm gonna do today is stare at the screen and get nothing substantive accomplished, or I'm going to spend my day sort of puttering around, um, maybe watching a little TV at some point, maybe cleaning the house a little, maybe, um, driving to town. So right there, at first thing in the morning, I gave myself permission to have that kind of a day. Now I know there are things you absolutely have to do every day. Like you may drag yourself to work. So, you know, you, you kind of have to do the minimum. I used to actually call these minimum days. I had, well, I still have, but I had severe fibromyalgia, severe insomnia, um, and a lot of physical problems for years and years. And so there were days when I had three kids, I had to get up and feed them and make sure they were clothed and all that stuff. Well, we didn't always get clothed, <laughs> but I had to feed them. Um, those biological needs do get met. But I would do what I called minimum days. And it meant keeping me and my children alive. And it didn't necessarily mean that I would get decently dressed it often meant like sweat clothes or whatever and I would do the absolute minimum and lie down whenever I could on those days because I was in a lot of pain I didn't have much I could do I was my hands hurt so much at the time that I couldn't even type for more than about 10 minutes and it was frustrating because I was trying to finish my doctorate and I was an assistant professor and whatnot anyway I learned to have minimum days and I learned that when you give yourself permission to do what you know in your heart is all you can do, that Chinese finger trap lets go of you. And it will allow you to do the bare minimum if you promise it not to do more, not to try to do more, because frankly, you're not gonna be able to do more. Okay, now here is another weird thing. And that is sometime during the day, go to a physical place where you could take a step that would be in the direction of what you're trying to accomplish. I, I wrote about this once and I called it a day map. And I literally meant where you go geographically during the day. Um, a lot of people take it to mean just a schedule, but I actually meant write down the, the physical places you're going to be during the day. So if you can't work out, go to the gym, like if you, if, if you're trying to get fit and you think you should work out for hours and you know that's not going to happen, but you will get in the car and go to the grocery store. Also drive to the gym and like park in the parking lot for a second and then leave. I know that sounds insane, but it actually it's called action priming and it's a really powerful way to get the brain moving in the direction of whatever you want to accomplish. But remember not to, it should never feel like trying. And then next, you do one small smidgy widgy thing. When you go to that place, you do one thing that takes you in the direction of whatever it is you're trying to do. So for example, for me, I was just talking to this about our immersion writers in Ride Into Light about turtle steps. And if you've read my work, you know all about turtle steps. A turtle step is the, it's something you can do easily on the worst day of your life. And you take that and divide it in half. 
So if you don't go to the place, the physical place, like for me, my physical place of work is my computer. So just opening the computer is a place to go. Other people go to their, like um, Ro, who's often, she's sitting here being my technical support. Hi. She We were just talking about how I can write anywhere, but she has to be in her study. But just going into her study and sitting down would be the step. And then, so for me, it's the computer. I open it and give yourself a reward for being there. Right after you do this step, you give yourself a reward. So I would go in, say, look at my manuscript, maybe make a single edit, like read through a sentence or two, make a single edit, then immediately watch an animal video because that is my nature to love watching animal videos. I just watched a video of a brand new baby giraffe trying to stand up. It just made my day. And then that's it. That's all you do. Um, I just read a book on how to get big things accomplished with small steps. And it talked about how if you, people who do one push up are more likely to continue getting fit than people who try to do a full workout. If they give themselves permission to do just one. The idea, is to get the energy of trying and shoving to give way to the energy of flow. And flow follows nature. Flow follows happiness. Flow follows reward. Flow is, oh, it, it's what animals are following. And you have to treat the soft animal of your body the way you would treat a dog or a horse that you're trying to train. So again, stop pushing. Give yourself permission to do what you're already gonna do. Go to a physical place or a physical, even a, adopt a physical position, like going and sitting at your desk, um, that allow would allow you to move forward and then take a tiny step followed by an immediate reward. And that's it. You know, usually the gathering room is all about spiritual issues. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here. But occasionally I get locked in a place in my life where I have to go back to my social science training. And this is basic Skinnerian operational training. You treat the body like an animal and you give it a very tiny reward for a very tiny action and it begins to flow in the direction in which you want it to go. So you can use it as a vehicle for spiritual practice. This is how I started meditating as well. And I ended up being a really, really enthusiastic meditator. Um, so you can throw that into your spiritual toolbox as well. But I just wanted to talk about the nuts and bolts of how to get unstuck from anything. So I would love to take a question here. And um, any topic is on the is, is fair game. So Rhonda says, do you believe the act of physically writing on paper in cursive? I've been doing at least three pages of what Julia Cameron calls, Cameron calls morning pages is better than writing on a computer. I think it is if you're having trouble getting your brain to move. I think anything that takes you toward the animal self, and for me, the pleasure, make sure you get a nice pen that feels good on the paper. And then I, if you like writing in cursive, do that. If you like printing better, do that. Do whatever comes easily. Ease, ease, ease is the way you get unstuck. You give yourself ease. At some point, you're gonna have to shift the energy to putting it in a computer unless you wanna handwrite everything, mail it to a publisher and have them burn it. Um, so when it comes time to switch the energy to a computer, that remember, that's a big place to get stuck. And you should give yourself small steps. You don't have to go to the computer and write in everything you've put down in cursive. Open it up and put down a couple of sentences and then give yourself a reward. Reward, reward, reward. It has to be. It can be very small, but it needs to be genuine. And the very act of writing in cursive on a beautiful piece of paper is enough reward for some of us. So, and by the way, morning pages are amazing. Love them. They will get you unstuck from almost anything. So thank you, Rhonda. Thank, thank you, Rhonda. Okay, I bet you never hear that, do you? Sandy says, I know this is your wheelhouse, but when your writing is stuck and fear takes over, what do you do? This is exactly what happens. Liz Gilbert and I were recording our call yesterday for Right Into Light, and we were talking about how no matter how much you write, unless you just redo everything you've ever thought, you are invariably sitting down to write something you've never written, 
and you have no idea whether you can do it or not. And there's always the eye of the reader looking over your shoulder, the, the imagined reader, and it's always frightening, always, like every day. So um, you boil it down to this present moment. You don't think about the writer in the future. And Liz gave us a wonderful um, tool. It just changed my life. Um, she was talking about a man who said uh, he was he was told, uh, I think his publisher asked him, could you write a novel? And she said at the time she heard this, her thought was, no, I couldn't write a novel. But this guy who'd never written a novel turned back to the publisher and said, well, I can write a bad one. And that you know, caused an epiphany for Liz. And it did for me yesterday as well when she told me, write a bad one, write something bad. Like that's way easier than trying to write something good. And the whole idea is make it easy, easy, easy. We try to do hard things. Glennon Doyle, another hilarious, brilliant writer says, she's always saying, we can do hard things. She's always galvanizing the public. But she said in public, it, she says that in public. And then she said in private to me once, we we're trying to do something logistical. And she said, we can do hard things, but we can't do easy things. <laughs> we we're trying to like open a door or something. <laughs> I don't know her very well, but she's a delight. Anyway, um, yeah, you, you write a bad sentence. I wrote a terrible chapter yesterday. And then I gave it to Rowan. She's like, this could work and if you take this piece and this. And I, it's hard, it's, it's scary. But once you give permission to give yourself permission to fail in that small way, the fear is much less and you can do it. You can get through it. And the same thing is true, by the way, with everything, you guys, anything you're trying to do. So Diana says, I get stuck on doing it perfectly. Oh, yeah, right? And Lamont says, perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor. It will stop us every time. And we live in a culture that has something I call the kindergarten complex. You get to be confused once in kindergarten. After that, you're supposed to know what you're doing. And you're supposed to get continuously more impressive as you go through your life. Other cultures that are more in tune with nature have a circular model of growth. It follows the seasons, you know? you. You gain ground, then you lose ground. And it's like any, it has the rhythm of anything in nature, summer and winter, the surf coming in, the tide coming in, going out. Well, um, if you try to move forward in a straight line, getting better and better and better and always achieving perfection, you are screwed, pardon my language. If you say, I'm gonna follow the natural rhythm and I'm gonna do what comes easily and I'm gonna do it for 15 seconds and then give myself a moment of delight. Uh, and you just bring that in and leave the perfectionism outside. It's, it's kind of like a mental barricade you put up and you, you absolutely commit to doing something small and bad. And what Liz was saying is this, this writer she was talking to taught a class and he would go, tell his students to go home and try to write a bad scene. And then they would take this whole class and at the end of the class, everybody would always decide that the best writing they'd done in the class was the first scene that they had deliberately tried to do badly because that set them free. So, good questions. Um, Rachel says, what if you have trouble identifying your steps? Well, Rachel, if you would, I don't know if this is even possible on this technology, but um, if you can type in what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, it can almost always be broken down into very tiny steps. So, for example, if I want to um, be more loving, something very general like that, I would, the first thing I would do is go watch for loving behavior in the world and see if I can identify it. Like, again, go online or walk through a town or whatever and say, where do I see moments of love being communicated? That's a step. Oh, I see that man smiled at that little girl. That made me happy. Smiling at a child would be a step I can take. Um, I don't know what you're trying to, to accomplish, but if anybody wants to put up something that they think is hard. Sure, put it up, there's just a lag. It's All right, lag, so okay, there's a put lag. Up. Rachel, if we see yours, we'll come back to you. Um, mm -hmm. 
We're looking at the other questions. Ah, hang on. We're going to find one for you. Okay, River says, hi, River. How do you keep easing from turning into procrastination? That's why you use the day map. You, and, and that's why you give yourself permission to do what you're already going to do. The idea is, okay, let's go back to operant conditioning, the scenario thing. If you want to teach a pig to push a shopping cart, and this is a real example, this is a real scientific experiment. They put these pigs in with shopping carts. Their objective was to have the pigs push the shopping carts around with their front trotters while they walked on their hind legs. But they, they didn't show them how and they didn't tell them what they wanted them to do. Just every time the pig went close to a shopping cart, they would throw in a bit of food. Then they would only, then the pig would start getting closer to the shopping cart because of the food. Then only when the pig was touching the cart would they give it food. Then only when one trotter was up. And by just continuing to move the pig into the place where it would do things and give it a reward there, they eventually got these pigs shopping around like pros, right? So you literally, physically, are gonna move around during the day at least to go to the bathroom, right? So if, you, if you're mobile at all, if you're not in a hospital, um, you actually can go at some point in the day, you're going to be physically moving. That's where you put in one action. One. Okay? Like if you're going to clean your whole house and you're a hoarder and it's a mess, but you, and you have to walk into the kitchen to get something to eat, you pick up one item to throw away and you throw it away, and that's your step for the day, and then you get a re reward. By the way, what happens when you do this, it, once you're moving, it's that whole Chinese finger puzzle thing. When you're in stasis and you're pushing, you create more stasis. But when you're in stasis and you start to find moments of movement, then you access flow and it starts to break patterns of action. And once that happens, you can start pushing gently, gently, softly, softly, catch the monkey, as they say. You can gently add more and more things into moments when you're already in flow. So that physical movement is really important. I have Rachel came back with Rachel came back she was trying to achieve, which is to mm. make her first album, and she's having trouble identifying the steps for that. Yeah, okay, so making your first album is the objective. And what you do is you, what I do, and this is something that may be too challenging for you, but it's all in your head, so it doesn't require as much um, elbow grease as other things. You picture what you want to happen. You picture yourself with this beautiful album, you picture cover art, and um, you know, you, then you, in your mind, you put it on your, on your stereo, whatever, and you listen to it. You imagine that it's wonderful. And then you pick your favorite song from that album that does not exist. And then you think, oh, is it happy? Is it sad? Is it a love song? What is it? You slowly kind of work backward to figure out what that song actually is. Then you think about the steps, oh, I would have had to record that song, I would have had to write, I would have had to perform the song, I would have had to write the song, I would have had to, and then you get right down to what can I do now? I call this going from eagle vision, where you see the long, long view, to mouse vision, where you look at what's right in front of you. So Rachel, what I would ask you to do today to get out of being stuck is listen to some music you really like and admire and really allow that to, to sort of swim in your psyche without pushing yourself. And then hum one line of a melody that you haven't heard before or write one phrase of a lyric. And it's it, uh, the, the part where you listen to the music is I, what I call filling the well. Like if you want to be more loving, you go out and watch for what's loving. If you want to write, you bring in, you, you read work that delights you or you talk to people who are writing. In this case, you put in music and then it jumbles around and you start to become creative a little bit. But Rachel, I can't say this enough. Don't do more than that in one step. Okay. Now we're getting closer to the end. So I will tell you what happens in the long run if you use this. What happens in the long run is that 
if I go in and I know this from writing and because I am like the most, I get stuck more than anyone I know. If I go in and edit one sentence, one paragraph, that action, that flow is going to start to pick me up. It's almost like the tide coming in. And if I do it a number of different, you know, on a number of days, and if I continue to reward myself, what happens is that the joy of the process starts to lift me. And there's an actual pull to go forward into the action. And this doesn't happen if it's not what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And in that sense, I think it's a highly spiritual practice because your, your spirit won't let you go too far in the direction of something that's wrong for you. But your stubborn human mind will get in the way of what's right for you if you're perfectionistic, if you try to do too much too soon, if you push yourself, um, if you criticize yourself, any of those things. So as you stop trying, give yourself permission to do what you're actually going to do, look at the, the, the physical movement of your life and then add these little steps and rewards, you're going to find yourself doing more easily. That's the key, easily, because everything good wants to be easy. I mean, well, I'll give you a quote from Hesiod, um, who's an ancient uh, uh, Roman writer. He said, um, in front of excellence, the gods have placed many obstacles, and the way to it is hard and steep. But when you get to the top, it is easy, even though it is hard. So there's a kind of easiness that comes from doing very small things until you're lifted by the the energy of the project itself. And there is an energy to everything that you want to accomplish in your life. And making friends with that energy by going slow and being easy and giving yourself rewards means that you start to have a relationship with it that's highly motivating. I'm going to go on for just a minute because we started a bit late. And I loved what Liz and I talked about yesterday. She was talking about how someone told her um, books are, he wanted to have children instead of writing books because she's, he told her a book can't love you back. And she said, that's not my experience. She says that writing has always loved her back and that she's in a relationship with writing that is deeply loving. And she is fine with doing a bad job and she's fine with taking time off when something's really interfering with the process. But she also knows how to lean in and start the action moving. And she, one of the ways is that she tells her project, I love you. And then the project starts to love her back because the world is a mirror. So as you do these little steps and get your reward, learn to notice what you love and to express that love to the very thing you're trying to accomplish. Love the effort itself. This is not supposed to be hard. Things are supposed to flow. That's how nature works. Everything else is our culture and it doesn't work for me. So I hope you guys got some good out of this. It's very nuts and bolts, but it's where I was today. So I'm hoping that it's been useful for some of you too. And I'm um, sending out much love until we gather again next week. Bye.